All right. Hello, everyone. We're very excited to be here. Lucas has been in previous KubeCons, but for me, it's first KubeCon and also first time on official travel for two years and a half. So we're very happy to talk you a little bit um, about the journey that we've uh, been going on in the last years to integrate Kubernetes into the Atlas distributed computing and help with the search for new phenomena in particle physics. I am Fernando Barreiro. I'm actually from Spain, studied information technology and telecommunications in Madrid. And after university, I moved to Geneva and have been most of my professional career working in the Atlas uh, experiment, covering different roles. And uh, lately, I'm running projects to integrate uh, Kubernetes and uh, public and cloud, uh, public and private cloud resources. And that's where I know Lucas from. Okay, hi everybody. I hope you're enjoying KubeCon. My name is Lucas Heinrich. I'm a professor for uh, data science and physics at the Technical University uh, of Munich, and I'm. Also, like Fernando, working on the Atlas experiment uh, at CERN. And my research focus is uh, kind of twofold. I uh, can develop uh, machine learning techniques and uh, statistical data analysis techniques to actually apply to the data. But I also uh, am very interested and exciting about uh, using cloud computing technologies to build up the actual infrastructure that enables thousands of physicists to uh, work with the data that we're uh, collecting at these big uh, scientific experiments that we have uh, at CERN. Okay, so uh, by way of introduction, what is CERN? So you might have heard about CERN already in the uh, keynote uh, today. Uh, so CERN is one of the major particle physics uh, laboratories uh, in the world. And so I, as a particle physicist, uh, view it as a particle physics lab, but the way that CERN probably impacted your lives the most is uh, by being the birthplace of the World Wide Web. Uh, so here on the right-hand side, you can see uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, who was working at CERN when he was drafting the first proposal for the World Wide Web. And as you know, you know the rest is history, and now we're all uh, using the web uh, every day. Um, okay, so, uh, but uh, in some sense for us as physicists, the uh, uh, invention of the World Wide Web, uh, which was originally conceived as a way to more efficiently exchange information between scientists, was just a byproduct of our scientific activity. And so here you can see uh, CERN, uh, so it's in a, a nice Swiss countryside, uh, it, uh, and we have many projects going on uh, at CERN, but uh, the biggest one is the Large Hadron Collider that you might have heard about in the news. It's a 27 kilometer long uh, tunnel that is 100 meters underground. It goes through France uh, and Switzerland. Uh, and here we're uh, accelerating particle beams to almost the speed of light. And so we have two beams, one is going clockwise, the other one is going uh, counterclockwise. And at these four uh, specific points, we collide the beams head on, and then hopefully something interesting happens, like the creation of a new elementary particle. So Fernando and I, we both work at the ATLAS experiment, which in my mind is, of course, the best experiment at the LHC. Okay, so uh, here you can see a view inside of the tunnel. Again, it's 100 meters uh, underground. Uh, and so uh, these big things are big, strong uh, magnets that are able to uh, bend the beam into the circular trajectory, uh, even though the beams are going at the, uh, almost the speed of light. And so they're very strong magnets. Um, and uh, here you see what happens at one of these collision points. So I showed uh, there are four collision points, and this is the collision point where uh, the ATLAS experiment sits. So, so this is the ATLAS experiment. It's one of the biggest scientific machines that uh, humankind has ever built. And uh, so what is it? It's basically a three, uh, huge, giant, uh, three-dimensional camera uh, that uh, records what is going on during these particle collisions from all angles. So we want to know what is happening during these collisions so that we can analyze it uh, later on offline while we're taking the data. And so these collisions, uh, they're not happening you know, once a week or once a day or once a minute. They happen every 25 nanoseconds, and they produce a couple of megabytes of data per collision. So we have 40 million collisions uh, every second. And so uh, there's a lot of data that is being accumulated. So while in the former times, uh, you know, we analyzed the data by eye uh, using photographic plates, now we, of course, need a uh, very large uh, computational uh, infrastructure in order to uh, get, uh, you know, manage this data in an efficient way and actually extract some physics insight out of this huge amount uh, of data. Okay, so if you're uh, actually managing to uh, extract some interesting science out of it, uh, nice things can happen. So here, for example, we can uh, discover a new elementary particle. This happened uh, almost exactly 10 years ago. Uh, this was the announcement of the di discovery of the Higgs boson. And a couple of uh, years ago at KubeCon in Barcelona, we also showed how we can use Kubernetes to rediscover the Higgs. 
Um, and uh, so because of this discovery that we made uh, at CERN, uh, Peter Higgs was awarded the uh, Nobel Prize a, a year later um, because he was predicting the existence of this new special particle a couple of decades earlier. And so that was a nice success, uh, not only of the physicists and the work that they do, but also of the computational infrastructure that we build in order to run these uh, high-scale, uh, large-scale uh, scientific experiments. OK, but this is not a physics conference. I'll uh, not talk too much about the physics, but I want to uh, talk more about the computing infrastructure and how we actually manage the data. And so uh, in Atlas, we have a two-tiered uh, data processing pipeline, so to say. Uh, we have uh, one uh, kind of large-scale pipeline, which we call the production system. And the role of this production system to e is to either take the data from the raw detector output or from our simulation uh, and then pre-process uh, it in a way into a, a format that is useful for the uh, actual downstream uh, scientists. And so this is a very large scale operation. So we have a, a exabyte of data roughly. And so uh, this doesn't fit a single data center. So we need to distribute uh, globally across uh, something like a million CPUs. And Fernando is going to talk a bit about that. And it's a, uh, this pre-processing stage uh, is a fairly a uh, well-organized activity where you have only a few teams that are able to, uh, or in charge of pre uh, running this pre-processing campaign. And uh, so we heard a lot about batch processing uh, also at this conference, and there was a co-located event about the uh, Kubernetes batch working group. And so this is a classic batch workload where uh, we're not super interested when this processing happens. We're interested that it happens at some point, but it doesn't need to be uh, now, it doesn't need to be tomorrow, it can happen maybe in a week from now. And so this is uh, uh, kind of the very large scale system. And then uh, the user analysis, like the data scientist uh, view of the system is uh, down here. And it's a couple of orders of magnitude below that. So it's at a petabyte scale. And so this is where you have individual teams of uh, data scientists and physicists that you know, look for like a specific uh, physics question in the data. And so here, it's still large scale. So uh, globally, we still uh, have something like 100,000 CPUs. But typically, a team works on uh, like one or two individual facilities. Uh, but unlike the production system, which is uh, this uh, few groups, uh, you know, highly organized activity, here you have a much more heterogeneous uh, setup where you have individual teams, hundreds of individual teams that train machine learning models, they uh, you know, do their data analysis, statistical analysis, pre-selection, and so on. So, so there's a very uh, rich bouquet of uh, individual things that you want to do. And ideally, you want to have the answer as soon as possible. If I, as a physicist, have an idea on how to process my data to extract some physics, I want to try it out this idea and imme immediately get the answer. So ideally, what we want to have is a kind of interactive data analysis experience where you can try something even though you're still kind of more, uh, roughly at this petabyte scale. And so the way that we're structuring this talk is that uh, Fernando is going to talk a bit about this first uh, production system uh, tier. And then uh, later on, we'll try to do a live demo and try to actually do some physics uh, uh, that uh, represents roughly what we're doing uh, in this uh, data analysis tier at the bottom. OK, so I'll hand over to Fernando. He'll talk to you about the, uh, the production system. And then uh, we go to the demo. Thanks a lot, Lucas. OK, so while most of the people started hearing about CERN and um, Atlas around 2008, which is which, uh, when Atlas started to go into production, and then there was more media attention, also books like uh, Don Brown's Angels and Demons. But these experiments are actually being planned uh, decades in advance. So Atlas was being discussed in the 90s, and the computing infrastructure was being discussed the late 90s and beginning of the 2000s. And back in those days, there was simply industry was not at the level that it is now. Um, there was no cloud computing. There were no uh, massive storage systems and uh, no real off-the-shelf components that Atlas could use um, for the processing of, of their data and the storage. So for this reason, in 2001, the worldwide LHC computing grid was uh, conceived. And uh, they came up with a plan of that uh, each of the university and laboratory that was participating in the ATLAS experiment or in the LHC experiments, they would also contribute a little bit of, uh, for the computing power of the experiment and the computing storage. Um, so, uh, and then the WLCG also developed all of the middleware and storage uh, elements and compute elements um, that would be uh, doing the storage and uh, processing. 
Um, today, the Atlas statistics are around 165 uh, data centers uh, distributed in 40 countries. You can see here in, the, in this uh, image. The center is, uh, around, uh, is in Switzerland, around uh, Geneva. And since we are in Spain, also in Spain, you see that there are uh, three data centers. One is in Madrid, one is in Valencia. It's quite close, actually, here to the to, the, uh, to this venue, and also um, the tier one is in Barcelona. Uh, while the processing and storage is done uh, distributed, we have uh, central services that do actually all of the, all of the, they have the intelligence and the management of the data and of the, of the workloads. Um, the first system is Ruthio, it's responsible for the data management. Uh, it knows all of the data sets and files that are um, managed by the experiment and knows where they are in the grid. And then it's also responsible to interact with the storage systems like upload, download files, uh, schedule transfers between them and so on. To date, um, the Ruthio system manages around 700 petabytes of uh, data distributed around the grid. For the workload management part, we have another animal, which is Panda. Um, and Panda is talking with Ruthio constantly, knows where the files are, and then schedules the computational tasks uh, to, to, the, to the data, um, also depending on, on what is the load of each uh, site. And it's also responsible to interact with all of the compute systems and push the jobs into their batch systems. You see in this diagram, it was the evolution of the last uh, seven years, more or less. Um, how we have been growing, and to date we are on the 700,000, 800,000 uh, virtual CPUs for cores. Um, and the resources are different, so uh, the main component are the pledged resources, uh, which are the traditional grid resources. But then we also have um, opportunistic or over the pledged resources uh, provided by cloud and by HPCs that we have very successful collaborations with. Going a little bit uh, in a high-level diagram, so you see that we have um, our users, they interact with the data and the workload management system. These systems make the grid look like a unified resource and abstract all of the uh, distributed uh, uh, nature of the system. And then for the workload management part, we have this harvester component, which is the one that talks with all of the batch systems and, uh, and resources. Um, the typical flavor um, is the, are the grid sites and their harvester talks the HD Condor or the Arc middleware um, APIs to submit jobs. For HPCs, we have a lot of uh, collaborations and uh, use different supercomputers. And usually, this has to be done on a case by case basis uh, since every HPC is different. And then the one uh, site that we are actually focusing this, fo focusing this presentation on is the integration with Kubernetes. So this originated um, a couple of years ago. We were running a project with Google. Um, and we were thinking, how could we run uh, Atlas jobs in Google? And then was the, op the typical option was to, to fiddle around with virtual machines, contextualize them to, to join some, some batch queue. But instead, what we thought is that the best is to um, use Kubernetes as a, as a native resource. Um, because we can run also the Kubernetes clusters on, on our own sites, not only on commercial clouds. And also all of the commercial clouds um, nowadays, or the major ones, are offering uh, managed Kubernetes uh, clusters. Um, here we show a little bit how um, we integrated Harvester and Kubernetes. Uh, so the, the one requirement that we had is that we we were not starting from zero. We needed to integrate Kubernetes in a, in a structure that, was, that is already 15 years old or so on. And we needed to integrate uh, Kubernetes in a way that it offers all of the services that uh, a traditional grid site is offering. But at the same time, I also didn't want to install too many things on Kubernetes and wanted to keep it as simple as possible. So while most of the people know Kubernetes for like um, application management and service management, Kubernetes also has uh, native job controllers, which uh, allow you to run batch applications directly on Kubernetes. And we used just the native uh, job controllers, but if you attended the, the batch working group, for example, um, they are talking about a lot of extensions that uh, provide uh, additional uh, capabilities that we did not use at the moment. 
So in Harvester, we wrote um, plugins that use the Kubernetes Python API. They submit the jobs, they see the status of the jobs, um, and also when something goes wrong, they, they clean up um, Kubernetes jobs. And we also extended it a little bit with Kubernetes common op options. So we set limits so that the jobs cannot run out of CPU or memory. Um, we also use pod affinity and anti-affinity sometimes when you want, for example, the small jobs to get packed together and not spread around, into, around the cluster. And also, uh, rarely we use priority classes when we want to have some uh, higher priority for the um, larger jobs. And maybe the one thing that uh, sticks out a little bit from, from the pure Kubernetes world is this um, high energy physics file system that we need to mount, and that's the CVMFS. So you need to imagine CVMFS is like a content delivery network and the Atlas software and the, all of the high energy physics uh, software is um, distributed through this content delivery network. And then on the nodes, we have uh, a CVMFS client that fuse mounts uh, the file system into the node. And uh, so we installed this as a daemon set and then uh, CVMFS shares the, this file system through volumes with, the, with all, of the, all of the Panda jobs that are running in the cluster. Um, following a little bit the motto of this uh, KubeCon uh, conference, we've, I think we've been also going onward and upward. If you see the, the plot, we started, this is in 2020, we started with a handful of resources, each one was contributing uh, a couple hundred cores, and we had our uh, mini Kubernetes grid. Um, but then uh, we've been growing that uh, significantly last year. The, this uh, big part here that's uh, in blue, that's actually the, our first early adopter, which is the University of Victoria. Here, the, the site admin in Victoria, he, at the beginning, he was uh, testing a bit the water, seeing how it's working. And then he was actually uh, very happy with how it worked. And then he moved all of his resources into a big Kubernetes cluster and went away from the, from the traditional grid model. And he also was uh, very convinced about the, the support model that is generally in Kubernetes and the, like the, the white uh, support community. And then uh, we also, those uh, spikes that we see in the plot, um, that's actually when we are scaling out uh, to the cloud, and we can do this uh, at a very large scale, as I'll show you in the next slide. So some words about the Elastic uh, Cloud Scaleout. So this is actually the slide we are very proud about, um, and it shows how during the month of April, uh, we were trying out different configurations for our Kubernetes cluster that was uh, in, in Google in, the, in Belgium, Europe, uh, West 1. And we were uh, at the beginning scaling up to 20,000 cores, then we did 40,000 cores, and uh, we've ended up with uh, almost 100,000 cores. Um, and we also have been adapting our payload so that um, we are very resilient to, um, to preemptible VMs, and also lately we are running on spot VMs so that we don't have this 24-hour time limit. Um, and uh, this very last uh, scale out, close to 900, uh, close to 100,000 uh, cores, and we managed to run with a 1% uh, failure rate in our jobs on spot VMs, which have an uh, inherent uh, failure rate by nature. And during this day, we managed to process 100 million events on 100,000 uh, virtual CPUs in Google. Um, we use fairly big nodes. We try to use the 80 um, vCPU nodes and also some 32 vCPU nodes. So the cluster overall is um, 2,000 nodes, something like that. And from the Harvester point of view, it's a scaled Harvester instance that is also submitting all of the, all of the jobs to Victoria and to the other smaller sites. And yeah, and it's, all of this is... Con Ooh. All of this is controlled by um, just fractions of, uh, of our time. And then if we zoom in into the uh, 30th of April, it's uh, this, um, this uh, plot that I have down here. And here you see the contribution from all of the different uh, sites that are contributing uh, processing power to Atlas. And you see that we are the, on the 30th of April, not always, we um, were the second uh, contributor just behind um, Vega, which is a EuroHPC in the top 500 uh, supercomputer list um, in the world. So it's uh, something that uh, quite impressive, the amount of compute that you can, can add on, with not so much um, person power invested. 
The other cool thing that we can do with all of these Kubernetes clusters is provide um, heterogeneous architectures to, to the Atlas experiment. So we are living now, nowadays in this golden age um, for computer architecture development as ex um, described in this uh, ACM uh, communications article by uh, Patterson and Hennessy. Or also you see, and if you see the NVIDIA keynotes, you see, for example, how Jensen Huang pulls out the hottest GPUs out of the oven. So while Atlas for 99% of the um, processing that we do, we just need the basic x86 uh, CPUs, but we do not live um, completely isolated from what's happening outside. And if we are not able to um, modify our software to, for example, use ARM resources or, or use GPU, we are going to be missing out a lot of opportunities in the future. Um, one example that was uh, successful this year was, for example, the Atlas software team. They wanted to build their software um, for ARM and, want, and needed an infrastructure that from end to end they would want to um, simulate Atlas events on, on ARM. And um, while there are great sites that are interested in purchasing ARM, but no one wants to be really the first one to do so. So what we did in this case, uh, we had a grant through University of Fresno, um, in, and the grant is on Amazon. So we set up an EKS cluster with uh, Graviton 2 nodes. Um, and you see, well, in this, for, just for illustration purposes, you see uh, how um, the first 10,000 um, events ever uh, pro processed on, or simulated on ARM were being generated, and here they are being compared to events on x86 to see if they align properly or not. And also, well, one, one thing that I used for, for this uh, thing in particular were these uh, multi-arc Docker images, which really make your life much more easier. You just need to build the image once, and Docker will automatically, you say, the, the architectures you want to support, and Docker will generate the different versions of the image, and then when the client puts the image, um, the correct version will be uh, sent based on the, on the architecture of the client. Now, um, until now, I've been focusing mostly on this uh, batch processing and bulk processing. Uh, now we are shifting gears a little bit into the interactive uh, analysis that Lucas described. Um, one, some technologies that Atlas um, and the high energy physics uh, community is interested in are uh, interactive analysis facilities uh, based, for example, on Jupyter and on Dask. Um, so we installed on our GKE cluster, we installed uh, also um, uh, Jupyter and Dask and have been offering that to the users and also, um, for example, offering them to, to start uh, notebooks or, or Dask clusters using GPUs. Um, look, I will, this is how um, Jupyter and the task integration looks like. Uh, Lucas will show it live, so I will not uh, get into it. Um, but the one thing that is cool is uh, this plot here. And it shows this was done by Lucas. He's uh, scaling up his task cluster and running the same task um, again multiple times, but each time on a larger cluster. And you can see, um, first he ran the, the task with 100 workers and it took uh, 40 minutes. Then he ran it with 200 workers, uh, the time that he was waiting reduced to 20 minutes. And like that, until he was running it on 1,500 workers, um, the task is done in, in, in five minutes. And then he's done with the job. And if he likes the resources, the, the, the results, then he's done for the day, and if not, then he can, he can repeat the process interactively and uh, can really focus and, uh, on, on his science. And with uh, this kind of system, um, we provide him that capability. And the cool thing is that um, installing this setup, there are already Helm charts available that do most of the, of the work for you, like uh, the Dask Hub, which uh, provides directly Jupyter and the uh, Dask integrated uh, Helm chart. The thing that uh, I mostly needed to figure out was the configuration that I needed to add for scalability and also cost effectiveness. So I wanted to have like critical uh, pods in, in a particular node pool, which uh, is guaranteed so that the user is not connected and his uh, notebook gets slashed. But then, for example, the workers where we have uh, thousands of workers that I um, put into, in the, into cheap preemptable VMs, and like that, the cost is, uh, is much better. Um, and then one thing that I didn't uh, work with Lucas, but Lucas has had uh, different projects with uh, other people like Rihanna. 
um, it's all of these uh, workflow engines that you could also install on, on Kubernetes. Um, and like that, you have the whole, uh, the whole uh, computing capabilities that are needed in, in one single Kubernetes cluster. And also, um, I think that the presentation in this room after us will actually be showing uh, a demo or, or, or a presentation about Kubeflow use for machine learning uh, at CERN as well. And with that, I will pass it back to Lucas. Okay, thanks, Fernando. Yeah, so uh, we're now going to focus a bit more on this analysis side, and we're actually trying to do a live demo, so wish us uh, luck. Um, so what we're trying to, uh, to do is to recreate uh, roughly this plot. So it's kind of the history of particle physics as it goes through the decades, as we're able to uh, you know, build more powerful and powerful uh, particle accelerators, we can move from the left-hand side, which is low energy, to the right-hand side, to high energy. And every time we cross the energy threshold, we're able to uh, create new elementary particles. And so these peaks that you see are uh, each elementary particles. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see the J-Psi particle that was uh, in the 70s, a Nobel Prize. In the middle, you see the uh, B quark discovery. And on the right-hand side, you see also the Z boson uh, that was in the 80s, a Nobel Prize. And so these are old discoveries, so they're nothing new. But uh, what we can show is that we can rediscover these particles uh, live uh, in the data that we collect at the Large Hadron Collider, because it not only has it high energy, but it will basically create all of these particles uh, as you go as well. So uh, let's switch over to uh, this analysis facility that Fernando mentioned. We have this Kubernetes substrate. Part of this Kubernetes substrate is dedicated for batch processing, very large scale. And another part is uh, um, uh, focused on more analysis uh, focused uh, workloads. And so here we have uh, Jupyter. And uh, so I hope uh, this is going to work. And so Jupyter is a data science IDE that a lot of people like. So it's uh, very much used in uh, data science, machine learning, but also uh, by physicists. And uh, what we want to do is basically to uh, grab some data and analyze this data uh, in a uh, nice way. Uh, but of course, uh, in the kind of particle physics context, the data is much too large in order to just be processing, uh, processing it in memory inside of a single node, even if it's a large node. And so uh, we need to have a scale out system in the background. That, uh, so the user interface is just kind of the front, and then we have something that scales horizontally in the background. And uh, for this, we will basically take uh, our data lake. Um, and so we authenticate uh, to the, the storage, and we are able to uh, grab some data uh, from the data lake. And uh, here we are basically uh, scaling a cluster. Um, let me see. So the scrolling doesn't work. Uh, and uh, so here we see that we scaled up the cluster uh, while I was talking. We scaled it to 500 cores. And of course, 500 cores are not uh, 100,000 cores, as we talked about. But at the same time, remember that this is a multi-tenant system. So I, as a physicist, want to go to this facility and then request 500 cores to do my interactive data analysis. But then there might be 100 other physicists that also want to have each their 500 cores. And then very quickly, you scale up very uh, fast. And so here we can use a lot of the auto-scaling capabilities of, of Kubernetes to scale the cluster to whatever size is needed, uh, how many uh, physicists are actually trying to do data analysis, and then if it's a more quieter period, we can then uh, you know, scale the cluster down again in order to conserve costs, especially if it's on uh, public cloud resources. Okay. And so here, once you have a scaled up cluster, you can then actually uh, define your uh, physics analysis inside of the uh, Jupyter Notebook. And so I just have a bit tr uh, trouble with uh, scrolling. And so once you have uh, the um, uh, physics analysis defined in a Jupyter Notebook gets distributed to all the workers. And the workers, they uh, are able to do uh, embarrassingly parallel data processing where each worker grabs a slice of the data from the data lake. Uh, they do uh, whatever processing the user requested. Uh, so we are trying to extract some physics information from the data. And then the results get accumulated back into this user interface um, until we are, uh, and then we can uh, visualize it. So what we are doing here in particular is that we use Einstein's famous like energy and mass relationship so that we can infer the energy of the original particle by measuring uh, the mass of the original particle by measuring the energies of the uh, decay products. And Lucas, so this, Lucas, um, uh, yeah. you show us the dashboard. Yeah, I'll show, show the dashboard. I'll just need to. Uh, copy this uh, URL. So th this is nice. So unlike like a batch system, uh, what we see is that we have uh, basically 
uh, real-time view on what's happening inside of the data. And so here we are uh, actually visualizing the results, and we recreated uh, the plot that we just showed in the, uh, in the uh, original slide. And so uh, we can also go uh, to the dashboard. Let me see. And so, so you can see kind of in, in uh, live view of what's happening inside of the dashboard and uh, what is uh, happening on the data processing side. And so this gives us a very interactive feel of uh, what's going on. And so here we basically processed 60 million events in just uh, two minutes. And we basically recreated all of this uh, particle physics history uh, live on Kubernetes uh, in a live demo. So I'm very happy that this worked, even though the scrolling didn't uh, work uh, just as well as we wanted to. Um, OK, so let's uh, go back to uh, our slides. Uh, so this is uh, my summary. So what we showed is basically uh, the way that we uh, imagined interactive data analysis for physicists to work. We have a data lake uh, that is uh, close by to the analysis facility. It's uh, hundreds of terabytes or even petabytes. And uh, as a user, I log on to the system, and I can scale out dynamically to whatever uh, many cores I want. And then it's a multi-tenant system uh, where a lot of people are able to use this interface, and they can use Jupyter Notebooks uh, in order to do their uh, data analysis. OK, so for this, I'll then uh, hand it back to uh, Fernando for the summary. Thanks for the demo, Lucas. Yeah, so just concluding. Um, so I think we've uh, shown you that Kubernetes goes uh, far beyond just uh, pure service management. Uh, we've been using it uh, natively for batch processing. We were even not expecting we would get to this scale. We were thinking this would be at a, a few thousand uh, cores. But we managed to scale up to 100,000 cores in a single cluster. And I think that uh, we might not be at the limit yet. And we are already trying to convince people to <laughs> let us try a um, higher scale. Uh, managed Kubernetes clusters simply work. They work great. They, uh, you don't really, the less you look at them, it's better. They auto heal themselves. The, the broken nodes, they get repaired or, 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 or swapped. So it works very nicely. Um, also, Kubernetes, we can run it uh, on prem, we can run it on the cloud. Um, it's going to be the same thing. Uh, and also, it's very easy to integrate what I call exotic resources. It's just the resources that we don't have a lot of um, in our grid sites. Um, besides this uh, batch processing, processing, we also showed this uh, kind of next generation interactive services that, uh, that users can use for interactive analysis facilities. Um, and also, uh, Kubernetes provides a very high el elasticity um, to, to scale up and down with the, as the users. Uh, request the workers. And obviously, there are other functionalities that can be added, other services, um, functionalities from that, for example, are being uh, looked at in the Kubernetes working group for patches and so on. Um, and well, in the next years, we will see how this, uh, all of this Kubernetes integration is accepted in, in our um, WLCG world. And um, maybe one dream is, can we have, the same way there is this from zero to Jupyter, can we have a, a Helm chart on GitHub that does from zero to a, to a grid site, where with one, one commit you will have a grid site uh, installed. So we will see how far we get there. Um, and also, uh, we need to see how, um, in our university settings, we will also start deploying more Kubernetes clusters. So yeah, it's, um, it's not perfect yet. There is still a lot of work to be done. But um, I think that uh, with a fairly reasonable a amount of uh, effort that we dedicated to it, we have been uh, reaching very promising results. Um, and well, and just to conclude, uh, some acknowledgments to people that have uh, worked with us. And also, I mentioned that uh, Google actually gave us the, the funding for, for Lucas' demo. So thanks a lot for that. And uh, that's it from us. <laughs>